to church leadership. But the interesting thing is, as we move through this, we're going to notice some things that were happening in those early churches, the local churches there, in that Crete area. And the interesting thing to me is this, some of the things that were present in those churches, that church in general, many years ago, are also still present in the church today, in the local church. So today I want you to look with me at a church's insights. We find from the book of Titus here that you can find fellowship in the local church. We find from the book of Titus here that you can find fellow laborers in the church. You can find fruitfulness in the church. And also we find here that you can find foolishness in the local church. But we will see very clearly that even with all the troubles that were present there at the church at Crete, there were still some good things that were happening on the inside of that assembly. And I'm glad to say, and also at the same time, in one instance, sad to say, that you can find each one of those attributes right here at Oakridge Baptist Church. But I'll go so far as to say also that you can find them in any local church body, every one of these attributes. Now, let's begin this morning by considering some of these good things. Look at verse 12 and verse 13. Verse 12. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, Artixius, be diligent to come unto me at Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenos the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. The very first thing you can find in the local church is this, fellow laborers. Fellow laborers, people that are willing and gnawing at the bits to work alongside you for God and for the kingdom and for his glory. Now, it seems that this letter, this epistle, that's what epistle means, this letter was written probably during the autumn months. Notice here that Paul says he's planning his next move out. And he plans to go to this place called Nicopolis for the winter. And he writes to Titus and he, he, he desires for Titus to join him at Nicopolis. He, he said, I'll send somebody to take your place, Titus, there in Crete. Your job is an important job. You've done it well. You've done it di diligently. But I've got something else that God has spoken to me about you doing, and you're the very man for this job. I'll send somebody to take your place there in Crete so the work can go on, but I need you to come and be with me. And in these verses, you'll notice that Paul begins to name some of his most trusted ministry associates. And I love this because this is pretty much like a who's who, Christian who's who, uh, of those in, in Paul's day. Notice some of the names he mentions. First of all, there's Titus. Obviously, Titus was very dear to Paul. Obviously, Titus had been very vital to the ministry there at Crete. And then he mentions Artemis. Artemis is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament right than right here. But history records for us that eventually this very fellow Artemis became the bishop at Lystra. And then there's Titius. This is a man that had proven his work many times over to Paul there in the past. Twice Paul, uh, we find, sends uh, him from Rome to Asia during Paul's first imprisonment. He's the very one that Paul trusts. In Ephesians 6.21, Paul speaks of Titius, and he refers to him in this way, as a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. What a great testimony that is. Wouldn't that be something for someone to say that of us? They're a beloved brother in the Lord. They're a beloved sister in the Lord. They're a faithful minister in the place where God is called. What a great testimony. And then there is Zenos. And Zenos is described as a lawyer. Now, this is probably not a Jewish scribe. In other words, Zenos had been of the Jewish faith, but he'd been converted. And now he was a very faithful follower of Christ. And finally, there's Apollos that's mentioned. Uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 18, verse 24, it tells us, Acts 18, 24, that Apollos was an eloquent speaker, a speaker rather, who knew the scriptures very well. Apollos also was a Jewish convert. Uh, you might remember his name as being mentioned in Paul, uh, by Paul, when Paul was writing to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to be exact, where Paul reminds them, I have planted and Apollos is water, but God gave the increase. What was going on there in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 was this. Those people were, were playing trading card with the ministers. Some would say, oh, Paul is a better minister. I'd rather hear Paul preach than anything else. Others would say, no, Apollos is the better minister. I'd rather hear Apollos. It almost got to be a thing of somebody saying, I'll, I'll trade you two Pauls for 
one of Paul's. It was almost like that. Paul said, that's crazy. He said, we're not in competition. We're on the same side. We are fellow laborers together. And Apollos is a very important fellow laborer. As a matter of fact, it probably was this Zenos that we read about here and Apollos that were the couriers or the carriers of this epistle, this letter, bringing it to Titus personally. Now, what I really find so encouraging as I read about this group of men is one thing is their willingness. Their willingness to go wherever they were needed at the drop of a hat, at a moment's notice, no questions asked, no hesitation. If God needs me there, I'll go there. And not only that, their willingness to do whatever needed to be done. Folks, that's the kind of cooperation that you're going to find among people who are genuinely focused on one thing, and that's serving Christ. That's the kind of cooperation that you're going to find among people who are more focused on glorifying Christ than glorifying self. <laughs> Titus had been sent to Crete for a season. He'd done a wonderful job, and now he's needed elsewhere, apparently. And Titus is willing to go wherever he's needed. You know what? I praise God for the willingness of some of the people in this church. You might not be aware. You might not get out and about among other churches as I do. But I want to tell you something. Facts. There are some of our churches that this year will not be having a vacation Bible school because they can't get the volunteers to fill enough positions to have a vacation Bible school. There are some churches that their Sunday schools are getting to the point to where they're combining classes so much that everybody from the youth department to adults are all together in one single class. Why? Because they can't get fellow laborers. I'm thankful that we have people here in our church that basically say to us, when we come to them through the nominated committee along with the staff, look, just put me somewhere. I don't care where you put me, wherever you put me, I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. I don't care where it is, I don't care what it is that you need for me to do, I just want to serve the Lord. You know what, they're kind of like spiritual buddies from Buddy Carpet commercial, you remember that back in the day? Buddy's gone on now. But you remember that? He used to come on the commercial and he said, I don't care about making money, I just love to sell carpet. <laughs> These people are that way spiritually. I don't care what you need for me to do. Tell me what you need for me to do, and I'll get the job done. We have people on standby who can step into certain positions in our church at a moment's notice. And occasionally, very occasionally, they're called upon. All across this church, we have not just servants of God, but faithful, consistent servants of God. And I want to tell you something. They do not do it. For the notoriety. They don't do it simply because of obligation. Simply because they have a sense of duty. And they certainly don't do it for the money. They do it for one reason. Because they love the Lord. And they want to serve the Lord that they love. Amen. Because they care. But folks, you folks don't just serve. You serve together. We are truly fellow laborers here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church. And that is so important because of one simple fact. We can do a lot more together than we can do alone. We can Amen. do a lot more together than we can do alone. Remember Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. Important words. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one, he said. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a three-fold cord is not quickly broken. Folks, it takes us all. It takes us all. May we continue to labor together for the sake of the gospel. Fellow laborers can be found inside the local church. Now, this group that Paul names here in this chapter was focused truly on what matters. They did not have time. They did not have any room for pride or ego. There was no time for jealousy. Each one of these people were willing to go where they were needed. Every servant of God was willing to do whatever was necessary. Again, no question, no hesitation, no, oh, I'd rather not do that, give that to somebody else. They just went ahead and did it. Those who held certain positions were willing to step aside even and allow somebody else to take their place if that's what God wanted, if that's what was needed. This group, folks, was focused on the kingdom of God.
and they were willing to work together because they were working toward a common goal. That is so important. Did you ever see the geese fly south in the wintertime or just before the wintertime? You see them fly in that big formation? Uh, I've seen that for many times over many years. I'll never forget when I was a boy, I had an old uh, German Shepherd dog that loved to watch those geese fly over. But the problem was when he watched those geese fly over, he'd follow them. And they'd usually fly right above his head. So he'd watch them go all the way over and then fall over backwards. We got tickled at it. You know why those geese fly in that bee formation? It's aerodynamically correct. Now, NASA has not confronted those geese and told them that. Those geese never went to meteorological school or anything like that. How do those geese know it? God puts it in their heart. They know it. Now, those geese, that bee formation as they're flying, that helps them. Because no single one of those geese would be strong enough to fly all the distance that they need to fly in and of themselves. So as they're flying in that bee formation, it's in such a way that the draft, NASCAR fans will really appreciate this, that the draft helps those who need to rest for a while. So they simply leave their wings out and they coast while the others do the work. And then the others take a break and the ones who have just been resting are now recharged and able to do that. If God's geese know that we can do a lot more together than we can by ourselves, how is it that somehow that we don't realize that we need to? I'm glad that when you take a look inside of Overridge Baptist Church, one thing you can find for sure are fellow laborers, people willing to walk, work alongside you. Now, here's spiritual man. If you've got fellow laborers that are working together, two or three able to do a lot more than just the one, many more able to do a lot more than just the two or three, working together, it is going to follow that they will be fruitful. Fruitful. And that's the next thing. Look at verse 14. And let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. You can find fellow laborers in the local church, but when you look on the church's inside, you can also find fruitfulness. Paul speaks here of the importance of maintaining good works. And he also declares that Christians, if they're true Christians, every single one down to the person should not be unfruitful. Now, if you take the negative and turn it into a positive, what's that saying? True Christians should be fruitful. Back up there at the very beginning of this little epistle in chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, put them in mind, put these churches in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, be a good Christian citizen. But then he goes on and he says, to be ready to every good work. That's the goal of the letter. That's the purpose of this little epistle. Paul wanted the people of God to do good works. You don't do good works in order to be saved, but once you're saved, you should do good work. They should flow from your salvation. Paul's simply saying, let the Christians be Christians. Let them do what they do. Let the fruit come from the fruit tree. God wants his children to be fruitful. God wants his children to be productive for the kingdom of Christ. Titus tells us how the church should operate. When the church operates like it should, the people in the church will be fruitful. You can't get around it. Remember Jesus told his disciples something very interesting in the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 15, the true vine chapter, John chapter 15 and verse 16. Listen to this. John chapter 15 and verse 16. He told those disciples, you haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Jesus said to these disciples that he chose them. i got some exciting news for you today. In the same way that he chose them, He's chosen us. And He's chosen us for a purpose. And that purpose simply stated is to bear fruit. We bear fruit by evangelizing. We're to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ at every turn, at every place that we go. Whether it's in the neighborhood, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's one-on-one. -on -one, we're to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. We're to point them to the Savior. And no, we cannot convert them. But we certainly must and can compel them. And when they're converted, at that point then we have the opportunity and the responsibility to disciple that new believer, to mentor that new believer, to train those new believers. Jesus said He's chosen us and He's ordained us to bear fruit. 
And he also says that our fruit shall remain. What that means is it's not going to be just a temporary success. When you bear fruit for the Lord, true fruit for the Lord, that has eternal consequences. It will remain throughout eternity. Friends, we should be fruitful as individuals. When we are, we can have a tremendous impact on the entire body of believers. My prayer is that when God looks inside of our church, that he will always see increasing more and more fruitfulness. Now, one other thing. Along with fellow laborers and fruitfulness, look at verse 15. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Verse 15 tells us you can also find fellowship in the local church. Now remember, this little letter, epistle, was written to Titus, ordained the first bishop of the church of the Christians from Paul, but also notice that those that were with Paul at the writing of this letter also send their greetings to Titus. I get the picture in this way. Paul is with writing or dictating this writing to Titus. And there are fellow Christians that are standing around. Hey, Paul, what are you doing? Well, I'm writing a letter to our brother Titus over there in Crete. And I'm encouraging him to come and be with me and accomplish when winter comes on. So I'm writing to Titus and encouraging him in the work of the Lord. And all these people say, oh, Titus, tell him I said hi. Tell him I said that I'm praying with him. Tell him that I'm encouraging him too. They add their greetings to Paul. And here's my point. There's a common bond. There's a common bond between all of them. There's a common bond between all of these parties involved. They were in different places. They were serving in different capacities. They had different ministries. And yet they're all brothers and they're all sisters in Christ. Jesus was their Savior. Ministry was their purpose. Fruitfulness was their goal. They were united in that. They were headed in one way. Spiritually speaking, they had the same DNA, a DNA rather, on the inside. You know what that means? They were family. They were spiritual family. Folks, the same should always be said in the church today. We should and do have that sweet fellowship and that spirit of unity in this assembly. We must always strive to deepen it. You, you know, the Greek word for fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. We used to make much of that when I was younger. I remember that one of our worship times at Northern Kentucky BSU was called our koinonia night that we always had on Thursday nights. We had a class here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church that was called the koinonia class. You know what koinonia means? Because if you don't, you ought not to be using it. The word koinonia means this, communion. It means partnership. It means joint participation. It means sharing in common. It means something widespread and yet familiar and ordinary. You know what it means? It means spiritual family. And just as important as your blood family is to you or should be to you, their blood is running through my system. Their DNA is within me. There is a bond that binds. And I, I've got their back. They've got my back. We're there for one another. We're moving toward the same goal. Physical family is important. But I want to tell you something else. Spiritual family is just as important. And we have the same spiritual DNA if you're a Christian. This common bond experienced by Christians, by the way, is not natural. It's not natural. It is supernatural. It is knit in the hearts of believers, true believers, by the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. I mean, think about it for a minute. There are many different uh, people, and there are many different personalities coming from many different backgrounds, but if you're a Christian and I'm a Christian, we are joined together by the common bond of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so what do you have? You have blacks and whites, men and women, millennials and baby boomers, rich and poor, doctors and laborers, UK fans and Louisville fans, seniors and teenagers, all together working toward the same. How do you do that? How do we coexist when we're so different? Friends, I want to tell you it's possible one way, and that's only through the common bond of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we can join together and we can commune because we're brothers and sisters. That, that is fellowship. We can work together for the cause of Christ. Why? Because we're fellow laborers together. And we can see people come to faith in Christ and see others mature and grow in their walk with the Lord. Folks, that is fruitfulness. And those are three of the four things that you can see when you look at the churches in size. There's the question. Are you doing your part? Are you doing your part? 
Are you a fellow laborer who is actively involved in the fruitfulness and the fellowship of this church? Because I want to tell you, if not, you should be. If not, you ought to be. Why not make things right and begin to do those things that God has been calling you to do all along? Why not step out and say, I want to be part of this? Maybe the reason that you're unprotected from the Lord is because you turned your back on the Lord. You've gone your way. You've abandoned His call on your life. You've drifted far from your spiritual morals. If so, I want to encourage you to return to a right relationship and a right fellowship with the Father today. Or perhaps you're here today and you've never been born again. There's no time in your life that you can look back upon and say, that's the point where in prayer, I made my commitment to the Lord. I asked Him to be my Savior, and I made my commitment, my lifelong commitment to Him as my Lord, my King, my Master. If you cannot look back and find that time, my friend, the Bible defines you as being unsaved. In other words, lost. Maybe you're here today, and you're lost. doesn't have to be that way. Let me give you the gospel a little bit. Life is short, death is certain, judgments come in heaven and hell are eternal, and Jesus Christ is the only one of salvation. That's Amen. the gospel. Today could be your last opportunity to be born again. Turn to Jesus while there's still time. Because if you will, then look at what happens. You can become a fellow laborer in the work of God who is fruitful in the kingdom of Christ, and you can enjoy family fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can experience firsthand these first three things that we've looked at as we've looked inside the local church. We have out with for prayer for us. Lord, if we come to this invitation time today, thank you so much for these wonderful things that we find inside of the church. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And if there's any decision that we need to make for you, Lord, that today we take that decision. Lord, I pray also for any that might not know you as Savior and Lord in particular, that Lord today might be their day of all days. Help us in this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. 294 at my own way. 294. <laughs>
bless you this morning. I'm going to invite you to come back and be with us this evening if you at all can. I uh, want to wish you a very, uh, very safe and happy uh, Memorial Day. You know, Memorial Day started right after the war between the states. There were some Christian ladies that got a burden on their heart. They went to the battlefields and the graveyards, and they didn't care which side, north or south. They decorated all the graves to honor those soldiers that gave their all. And so it became a, a tradition for us in our country to honor the soldiers especially that had given their all. Although we do pause to, to acknowledge and to, to honor all of those that have served our country and served our country well. I'm glad, though, that it expanded from that, that it came to be a time where we remember those that have gone on, soldiers and civilians alike, and remember those and honor them and honor their memories. So remember that as you celebrate Memorial Day tomorrow. Uh, also, I want to uh, ask your prayers for some folks. Uh, one is uh, we want to lift up Mary Ann Dyson. Uh, Mary Ann Dyson, she broke her hip, and she was scheduled to have surgery today. So please uh, lift Mary Ann Dyson up in your prayers. Also, I want to ask you to lift up the family of Jean Curtis. Uh, Jean passed away yesterday morning. I uh, have been in contact with, with uh, the family. And it looks like uh, they're, we're going to meet with the funeral directors today. So hopefully by this evening we'll have some arrangements. Uh, if you would like to know those, uh, we'll try to get all that information out. But if you'll lift all of them up, uh, Eric and Tanya and Linda, uh, Coyle, her sister, and all of them, just lift them up uh, and in prayer. I know they'll appreciate that. Do we have uh, anything other before we go on? We, we are privileged uh, to have a part in many different chapel services throughout our community uh, during the course of a month. I don't know how many chapel services that we do. One, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. I'm not sure. Uh, but each and every month. And on the fourth Friday of the month, we usually go to Fairhaven. And usually I'm joined by uh, Gerald's uh, brother and uh, used to be with all of us in the group. And, uh, Johnny, we had a service Friday night, did we not? <laughs> yeah. Amen. God blessed in a mighty way. I'm going to ask John, if he wouldn't mind, to lead us in our, our closing prayer this morning. Be happy. Be happy to do that. Dear Lord, this is Memorial Day, as you know. And all of our veterans, including my brother Gerald Stevenson, veteran, we honor and we remember all of our kinfolks this particular day and honor the fact that you let them be here on this, your earth, to grow and mature and come into the fold with you, which is the ultimate goal of every Christian. I pray and thank you for the message today, the message of laborers, of those who, in this church particularly, and all the other churches, who labor in the efforts, the efforts to bring people to Christ in your name. And today I pray a special prayer of thank you for the pastor of this church, Randy Wallace. In all my travels, in all my 75 years, I've yet to meet a person more dedicated to the service of the Lord than Randy. And I can say that honestly to his friends here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church and to all of the people of our nation. I'm very proud to be able to call him a friend in Christ. So Lord, watch over this church and all the churches, remembering that we are your servants and your will be done. And we all pray for that day when you come home to take us for eternal life and salvation. In Jesus' name, I ask you watch over all the people of this church and all of your churches as laborers. In Jesus' name we do ask it. Amen.
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy. Nice to see you. Uh-huh. God bless you. Whatever he is, yes. praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, how dog you. I love you. I think about you quite often. You call me now if you need anything. Yeah. Are you getting some work done on the house or something over there? Yeah. I um, saw a sign out front there yeah. and I thought, well. I'm trying to get enough. I know that feeling. You know that feeling. Sit back there. You were uh, complimented quite strongly by my CEO. He <laughs> thought you were great. Well, good. Really enjoyed yourself. How are you, buddy? I'm hanging in there. You're still kind of weepy, but. Yeah, getting there. At least you know where she is. Yeah. I tell you, I'm one step ahead of the undertaker. Well, <laughs> I told my wife today, you know what I told her? I said, How's she doing? She's doing pretty good. I said, Hun, you know, if I die, I guess you're going to put my cell phone in the casket with me because I'll still be trying to film. <laughs> Either that or writing. God bless you. We miss, miss your brother George, don't we? Well, you, you know, uh, Oh, I didn't know that, did she? Is that right? Bless your heart. They were a wonderful couple, and so are you. Um, it's a good Lord put any two people together. Yes, I absolutely right. Well, God bless you. Nice to be here with you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Nice to be here with you. Yes, sir. Nice to be here with you. God bless you. So bless you too. Keep him straight. I'm keeping him straight. That's it. Thank you, brother. Hi there. How you doing? And I want to thank my brother Jeff here, and uh, for going and picking up Gerald at Colonial Gardens and and God bless you and thank you. Nice to put a picture with the, with the name in their bus ministry here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church which to me is phenomenal. <laughs> bless your hearts. Nice to be here with you. Oh my, there they are. How are you doing? I think she might know this lady. <laughs> Certainly must. Don't run over anybody. Hi there. Thank you very much. God bless you. Nice to be here with you. God bless you. Lisa's a little breeze blowing. Away, yeah. Brighter sun now. Looks like it's a beautiful day, doesn't it? Yeah. A little warm, but I've got to We're show. For yeah, I've got to show my daughter two or three houses today. Oh. They've sold theirs, but they've got to find a place in 30 days. Here he comes. Wait just a minute, Jerry. Here he comes. I'm watching the car. Give him a break. Don't fall. And he probably will pull right up here, so don't. Be careful. Beautiful. Thank you all. Good 
go down and take another look at the electronic sign. Oak Ridge Baptist Church here travels with the Stevensons, 859-750-0000. Watch us on channel 422 on Spectrum Cable and all the other cable channels, 422 at 5 o'clock each evening and Sundays at 2 o'clock. Are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord? And Oak Ridge Baptist and its people are ready for the Lord. Beautiful sign and bell tower. Beautiful. The sound of music for the Lord. by Jimmy Brown's barber shop here. And going back to see Oak Ridge Baptist Lighthouse, the ministry of Oak Ridge Baptist Church. This is where they do their discipleship here and do a great job with it for all the young people, particularly those two that just were baptized today. And uh, their outreach is a love, labor of love. And here's the Nelson Ball family bus that they park here at Oak Ridge Baptist Church. Of course, Nelson Ball and family, great singers, gospel singers from travel all over the countryside, taking their gospel music. And occasionally, the old country boy here gets to sing my old Kentucky home with them, which I enjoy very much. God bless Nelson Ball and all the family. Last look at the new sign. and the bell tower. Fantastic. As we leave church there at Oak Ridge Baptist Church this morning, we come by uh, some places here. 